Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel and welcome back. Now today, I want to hit at the heart of a very important topic, a topic that relates to every single one of us artists, and that is motivation. And what I want to talk about, the angle I want to take today in today's conversation is not what you might expect. Yet, I feel it's probably one of the most relevant angles we should be taking, namely because of who we are as a species. And I'll get to that, so bear with me. Now, on the surface, there are many different types of artists, many different types of people. And some artists are known for being more productive. Some are known for being less productive. Some people have no problem getting motivated. Other people uh, really struggle every day. And as a teacher, particularly lately, I find in the last few months, I have been getting messages and having conversations with numerous students that really struggle to just stay motivated. And uh, in a way that they're basically saying, the problem is I just can't get myself to draw or I just, I sit down to draw with the intention to draw and I just can't do it. Almost as if they're describing that there's some outside force fighting against them. And this might sound like an excuse, but I guarantee there is a very large number of you listeners out there right now nodding your heads in agreement with what I'm saying, that you might feel that you relate to this and I too have many times found myself in that exact, exact same position where I really felt the need, the desire, the drive. I really wanted to be productive, but somehow every single time I sat down to draw, I just felt like my motivation, my energy, my focus, my drive, my ambition, my creativity just completely disappear. It's almost as if my, my body itself, my mind just took a 180 and threw me in the wrong direction and it kept happening over and over again. And this, after time, really started to take a toll on my feeling of self-worth, my feeling of confidence. My confidence in whether or not I was aiming towards a career that was going to be a struggle and a failure or a career that was going to be prosperous and lucrative or whatever the case might be. Now, here's the thing. As a teacher, it puts me in a position where, and, and as a professional, I might add, it puts me in a position where I get to see and feel what many other people feel. And it, it allows people very often will be very can candid with me and they will share with me their day-to-day -day lives and what influences them and what the reason why they had a crappy week that week. And we, we very often have somewhat more personal conversations. Now, of course, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, I'm an art teacher, but conversations do get a little bit more personal where people will start to open up about the things that they struggle with a little bit. And I start to notice certain trends. For instance, one of the things I've spoken about in the past is how exercising, actually exercising can help to improve motivation. And you might think that exercise, exercise improves motivation because it gives you a sense of discipline. It gets you doing things on a regular basis. Chemically, your body is cleaning itself out a little bit more. You're purging yourself of a lot of excess energy to allow you to settle down and relax. Absolutely. All of that makes perfect sense. But indirectly, exercise does something else that contributes to what it is that I want to talk about. It starts to help you balance and regulate you chemically, hormonally. And that's a major aspect of today's conversation. It's taking into account the science, the biology of who you are as a human being. At your core, at your fundamental core, you are a living organism that is comprised of smaller living organisms. You're like uh, uh, coral, for instance. Coral, if you look at the coral reef, corals are not, a, are, they're not plants. They are, they are a whole ecosystem of organisms that group up together to create these structures. And they create these structures as their homes. But that's essentially what corals are. They are living creatures comprised of smaller living creatures. Well, 
it might sound like I'm just getting philosophical with you, but that's essentially what you are. Okay. Now, uh, any living organism is by its very nature, uh, it re requires for its survival, living organisms require balance, a balance of temperature, a balance of nutrition, a balance of many different factors that allow it to live and survive and thrive. So our very survival is based off of this delicate balance. Different organisms have greater or worse tolerances for certain things. Like for instance, a human species can only survive within a certain limited uh, temperature range without suffering hypothermia, without the, your system starting to break down, without overheating, without your brain cooking, that kind of idea. But if you look at something like an extremophile, for instance, tiny microscopic organisms that's, that have survived for millions and millions of years in the heart of the Arctic, r underneath ice shelves, locked in blocks of ice or other extremophiles that live in molten, molten lava temperature water emanating from thermal vents underwater, essentially underwater volcanoes in a sense, toxic, extremely hot weather. But even they do have their own limits. Now, if you think of ourselves as human beings in this grand structure of, let me mute that, in this grand structure of living organisms on this planet, then we are one of the more fragile organisms. We are one of the more sensitive organisms on this planet. We can survive at much lesser extremes than for instance, an elephant or a kangaroo or a cheetah or a bear or a tiger because they have climatized themselves for more drastic situations, more drastic extremes in certain cases at least. So to compensate for this, we overcome these weaknesses intellectually, our ability to communicate, our ability to think, our slightly larger brains, which are very closely related to our diets, allows us the means to be able to create shelters and to create environments and to regulate our, the temperatures that we live in with things like heating and air conditioning. We are constantly trying to keep ourselves balanced. And one of the ways that our bodies keeps us balanced is hormonally. Our endocrine system controls our hormones and, the, and, our, and our endocrine system releases hormone into our body to help to maintain this balance, to help us to sweat, to help us not to sweat, to help to speed up our metabolism or slow it down, to help to calm us down or give us energy, to help us focus or to help us disconnect. Everything that we do is controlled hormonally. Now I'm not, this isn't science fiction, this is fact. This is scientific fact, at least as far as we know it to date, right? And of course, I'm giving you a very, very broad, very layman's perspective of this. And I'm sure that plenty of scientists could, could pick apart everything I'm saying with a fine tooth, tooth comb, but I'm just kind of trying to give you an overview of my perspective on this and why it's so important. Well, you as a living organism, are in a sense communicating with the living organisms that make up who you are. To give you an example of this, you have two hormones that control your energy level, your sleep and your wake times, and that's known as your circadian rhythm. Your circadian rhythm is the ups and downs of the balance of melatonin and cortisol in your body. Let's say if you're used to going to bed around 10, 11 o'clock at night, your body before that point starts to, to release melatonin into your system to help your body to relax, to put you in a restful state until eventually you fall asleep. Then after several hours of, uh, hours of sleep, once your body is properly rested, your body starts to re release cortisol into your system and that will slowly wake you up. And then as you start your day, you'll have a nice boost of energy to get you through the day. And that cycle goes on and on and on. Understanding that you can, teach and you do teach your body to release these hormones into your bloodstream on a more regular, more consistent basis if you maintain a schedule. Now, understanding, of course, that the human clock, the actual clock, as in the 24 hour clock is a, hu is, is a, is a creation of humankind, but there's logic to that. 
our body, our hormones are regulated by these cycles of day and night, how the sun, how vitamin D, how that stimulates certain hormones in your body, how it can stimulate the release of melatonin, right? And vice versa. So regulating yourself on, a, on the, the, on the cycle of the solar system of this, of this solar system that we live in does make sense because we are uh, an adaptation. We are a creation and an adaptation of our, of, of our solar system of our, the universe that we live in, right? At least our particular situation with our particular atmosphere with the with the uh the chemicals that our body needs in order to function in order to stay alive if you go to bed at 10 30 at night every single night then come 9 9 30 your body starts to release melatonin to help you relax i don't know how much earlier before sleep it starts to release melatonin but it starts to know when where in that cycle Adam is going to go to bed. So it starts to release melatonin into my, into my system. And if I do this for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, I've started to, not even a couple of months, weeks is all it takes at most, maybe even a week. Your body starts to follow that rhythm. Your body starts to know when to behave in a certain way. It starts to know how, what to release into your bloodstream in order to allow you to function the way you've chosen to function based on your patterns. You keep doing that for long enough, eventually your hormones, your own endocrine system, your pituitary will know when to signal your glands to release these hormones into your brain before you even ask it to. And that's why if you're on a strict enough sleep schedule at 1030 at night, bang, you're asleep. And at seven o'clock in the morning, bang, you wake up. You don't even need an alarm clock at a certain point. Your body just wakes up on its own. You can I can look at my clock every single day. And at 8.30, 8.30 a.m. every single day, I open my eyes and I look at the clock. In fact, I look at it at 8.29 right before my alarm goes off. Because I do it every day. Because I've gotten into that pattern. Even if, even if one night I stay up a little bit later and I stay up till three in the morning, which is rare, but if I did stay up that late, I would still wake up at 8.30 because my body is regulated that way. So in a sense, at the beginning, I had to make my own effort, but as I trained my hormones to behave in a certain way at a certain time, eventually, my body would get this wave. It's almost like, it's almost like being a surfer, where at first you're trying to paddle as fast as you can to get yourself moving, but after a certain point, your body your body will just naturally send you waves. There, there'll be a tide, there'll be a current that'll flow in at the same time, at the same place every single day, and you just ride that wave. So the very act of falling asleep becomes easier and easier and easier. Now, of course, there are many factors. There are many health issues and factors that can mess up your tide, right? It can mess up the flow of hormones in your body, of course. But we're not on that one yet, okay? Now we're just talking about under normal, under normal situations, under, under normal circumstances. So if you take that into account, and you, we, we, I bring you back to that whole conversation of weight training, of exercising. Well, it doesn't matter if it's weight training. You could go for a jog every day, or you could skip rope, or whatever the case might be. If you do that consistently, at around the same time every single day, your body starts to train itself. At this particular point, you start to get the desire, okay, I got to go to the gym. And if you don't, you get what's known as, uh, uh, known as gym guilt or the lack of going to the gym. If I don't, if, for me, I do weights Monday Wednesday, for, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then I do cardio on off days. If I don't do that, I feel like garbage because my body sent a hormone into my, 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 Endocrine system, my glands sent a hormone into my body to give me a boost of energy and focus to prepare me physically for the task of exercising. And if I don't fulfill that, I get antsy, I can get moody, I can, I can, I can just feel unproductive and feel like crap. As such, by exercising, you're not only, it's not only to helping to regulate your hormones, helping you to clean out your blood, helping you to oxygenate your body and oxygenate your brain, which helps you to focus better. But it's also 
setting a rhythm to your body that every day at this time, my body starts getting ready to do these things. Being a teacher and being somebody who's set my own schedule because nobody's done it for me, I have two sections of classes, a morning and an afternoon class, Monday to Friday when I teach. And any of the, any bit of that time before, between classes, between my morning and afternoon class is, is time for me to exercise, time for me to paint, time for me to record videos, time for me to record this video I'm recording for you right now, edit videos, answer emails, take care of financial issues, any, any kind of business stuff, make important phone calls, any business that needs to get done happens between my morning and afternoon class. As such, I have a class that I'm teaching, same time every day, productivity and exercise time between those classes, back to teaching a class, then I have dinner, and then after dinner, my body has trained itself because I do it every day. It's not an effort. It's just because this is the schedule that's set for me, that I've set for myself. After dinner, after I spend some time with the kids and we relax and we've had dinner together, my body starts to come down and my body, my body somehow releases a little chemical, a little hormone into my body that said, that says it's playtime. I pick up my remote, I play some Sekiro. I play some, I play a video game for a couple of hours and I unwind and then I go to bed. And I do this consistently every single day. Do I work, do I, do I have time or the desire to draw six hours a day? And I'm using six hours as kind of a key word to kind of clue you into that buzz number that gets circulated around the industry online. Do I work six hours a day? I might have six hours, a, cons a consecutive six hours to work in a day if there's a cancellation or it's, I, I usually reserve Wednesday afternoons for extra work. So if I don't have an afternoon class, then, uh, then I might use that extra time. But otherwise, six hours to sit on my ass after I've already spent two hours sitting on my ass teaching a class and I haven't exercised, not likely, not likely. I think that's unhealthy. I think that's oh, pushing it too far. I think that's unsustainable because how many, how often during the week, unless you're working a nine to five job, how often during the week do you have time to sit down for six consecutive hours to just draw? Now, if you're a student and your full-time job is learning and going to school, well, and shit, you can do a lot more than that. I see my daughter, she works far more than that. I won't tell you how I feel about that. <laughs> it's, it is, the school load is quite excessive, particularly during the finals and stuff like that, but that's what she's doing. She doesn't have a full-time job. She doesn't have anything else she has to worry about. It's just school, right? So that's the time she spends doing that. But when we're talking about the long run, we're talking about the career, and we're talking about organizing your time and continuing to be productive and continuing to produce artwork every single day, six hours? No, I'm sorry. I don't believe that. I really don't, I don't buy that. Two hours, three hours, that's reasonable. I can pull that off. Sometimes it's only one. But the importance is that my brain is in productivity mode. My brain has released hormones, chemicals into my bloodstream to help me focus. It allows me to be creative and it allows me to block out distractions. It allows me to be in my work mode, be in my creative mode during that period of time. And that's what I invest my time into. And if it's a workout day, I can't get myself into that creative mode unless I burn some calories, unless I do some vigorous exercise first, come back, take a shower and sit down to get some work done. And even if it's only a couple of hours, it's a couple of hours every single day. And if you do that for five to seven days a week, you're talking 10 to 14 hours a week of, of minimum of work, of, of sitting down and, and training your skill. And that is substantial. Most importantly, it's sustainable, isn't it? Because if I try to burn myself out at six hours a day, every single day on top of working full time, on top of trying to get important things done, on top of trying to pick up my kids or drop them off at school, on top of all, all of these little doodads that make up a day, then I will start to suffocate and my social life will suffocate, and my exercise life will suffocate, and my relationships will suffocate. So the answer is no. I, I wouldn't encourage that, that rhythm. 
because it's not a healthy rhythm to maintain. It's the equivalent of exercising for six hours a day. No, I go to the gym and my workouts usually last at most. A really long, arduous workout would be about an hour and a half, but usually I'm in and out of there within 45 minutes. I'm about quality, not quantity, but it's consistent. I do it consistently. If I burn myself out, then keeping myself motivated to do that every single day becomes overwhelming. It becomes all-consuming. It's the same thing you'd say for people that are healthy eaters versus people who are obsessively healthy eaters. A healthy eater is somebody who avoids sugar as much as possible, a person who has healthy, balanced fats and nutrients, who eats greens every single day, drinks plenty of water, but not too much because that can strip you of nutrients. If you're somebody who trains and exercises, make sure you're getting a healthy, healthy carbs and healthy proteins, clean proteins, keeping yourself away from saturated fats, etc., etc., etc. Keep it simple, keep it stupid, but keep it clean. But if you're going to have a piece of birthday cake once in a while, if you're going to go and have yourself a couple of chips, have a couple of chips. Don't freak the hell out about it. Don't lose your mind because oh, I put a candy in my mouth. Oh my God. And what happens is people become su such purists that they can't live. I tried that for a little while. I tried the paleo diets and all these different things tried because I was having other health issues and stuff like that. And I thought to myself, who the hell can live like this? You can't eat anything. Literally 99% of the stuff that's in your closet is toxic to the body. No, it's not toxic to the body. And then there's all this, all, all, this, all this bullshit that circulates around about, you know, about hormones and about, you know, organic versus natural. Do your homework. And you're going to start to realize that a lot of that is bullshit. A lot of it pulls you into this extremist attitude. So you buy everything that has their name brand on it and not the other one. It's marketing and competition. Don't, don't fall victim to that shit. If it helps you feel like you're living a healthy lifestyle, fine. But if it starts to alienate you from being able to enjoy your life, if the quality of life starts to suffer, then it's time for you to calm down and start to reevaluate your idea of, quote, health, because health is about balance. Remember that happiness is also an important facet of health. So that's why playing video games once in a while and having sweets once in a while is, it's not not bad for you. It's actually good for you. When it comes to working and, and, training your brain and gain and training your skills artistically if you're in the zone if you're having fun and you find four five six hours have passed and you're still going at it because you're just having too much fun then keep going do give yourself breaks because you're messing up the circulation in your legs your, your legs need movement right you can't sit on your ass all day that's terribly damaging to your health but have fun do it there's nothing else if you would be sitting down playing video games anyways then go for it but don't think that you have to keep this up consistently every single day. Now, part two of this conversation is distractions. What are good distractions? What are bad distractions? Depending on your personality, some people need absolute silence to be productive. Everything needs to be dead quiet. And if anybody even sneezes, that person barks and yells down your throat and tells you to get the hell out of their house or whatever the case might be. They throw a fit. Other people have busy minds like myself. My mind's always going. It's all, I'm constantly thinking, constantly thinking. There's always something going on in my mind. I'm a very busy minded person. Although I do meditate when I can. Because it's very important to, to quiet your mind, to de-stress and to kind of reground yourself. At the same time, dead silence is more distracting than somebody screaming in my ear at full blast. Because my mind is so noisy that it pulls me away from focusing. So what I like to do is watch YouTube videos, have music playing, something going on in the background that can numb the noisy part of my brain so I can focus on my task at hand. However, there's a proper and an improper way to go about this. And this is a very common thing. I have people who ask me, for instance, you know, I just want to play video games. I just, I just, I keep putting it down to play video games. If you keep putting it down to play video games is because you've taught your body that at 2 p.m. it's video game time because you keep picking up that remote. Don't pick up the remote. Just sit down even if you get nothing done. Even if you get nothing done, consider that productivity time. And you sit down for those two hours, even if you sit on your hands, don't pick up the remote. Because what you're trying to do is teach your body, teach your hormones to change your 
playtime schedule. However, if you are sitting down and working and you want to distract yourself, here's a tip. A, longer videos. B, calming videos. Okay? What do I mean by this? You might ask yourself the question, why, Adam, knowing full well that the YouTube algorithm, algorithm does encourage slightly longer videos, like 10 to 12 minutes, and you notice that any regular mainstream YouTuber always follows that, that algorithm. So originally it used to be three minutes and then they bumped it up to 10 and then it was 12. Now it's probably still around the 12 to 15 minute mark so they can get a little bit more advertising in there. But my videos, they average probably around 40, 40 to 45 minutes. Why is that? Well, because I'm not making, I don't make my YouTube videos for money. I don't make it for fame. I don't make it for, to please the algorithm gods. I couldn't give a rat's ass about the algorithm gods. I produce my artwork. I produce my videos for you. And you, most likely, are an artist. So I don't want to produce videos that do the opposite of what I, they, I want them to do. I want to talk to you. I want to have a conversation with you. But I, and even if I have a painting, honest to God, I don't give you, I don't, I don't care if you even look over at the screen and look at what I'm painting right now. The painting is just a placeholder. It's just giving you something to look at. I could put a picture of a llama up there. It doesn't make a difference. I want to just be a companion that can listen to you, that isn't barking in your ear, that isn't yelling at you or trying to excite you or trying to get you to buy my product. What I want to be is a painting companion, somebody who's offering you inspiration Somebody who's giving you a place that you can relax and you can just listen to it and forget about it. And 40, 40 minutes is a very good amount of time to get you into the groove without pulling you away from it. So there's certain YouTubers that I tend to really enjoy, that I listen to regularly when I'm painting. A, if I could be listening to an artist who's doing a podcast that's, that talks for a long time, like um, Jeff Watts. I love listening to Jeff Watts, namely for the main reason is because he'll go on talking. He'll be doing a painting, but you can hear the, stu the, the art studio and you can just hear he's just talking art all the time. I like having an artist's mind as a companion while I paint. I like listening to him while I paint. Anthony Jones. I love Anthony Jones's videos because he doesn't, he doesn't compress himself to five minute videos. He goes on. Our last, when we did a, the last time we did a podcast together, it ended up lasting like an hour and a half. We, I, we just went off and just talked. I'm not sitting there going, oh, it's time to wrap it up, Anthony. No, I wanted to have a long conversation. I, I loved the fact that he kept going off on tangents from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing because what he's doing is he's not only expressing his thoughts on a certain topic, but he's also exposing you to an artistic creative mind, how the artistic mind creates these synapses between one thing and another. I love that. I love that kind of being transported through an artist's mind. Another person who I would compare a lot to Anthony Jones is Neil deGrasse Tyson. I was watching, I've watched him numerous times where he'd sit down and I was watching the one uh, on Joe Rogan. I was watching Joe Rogan. Again, uh, Joe Rogan, I listen to him all the time too. And Neil deGrasse Tyson just, you can't, you cannot shut the guy up. And even though you've been, even though you've been, he's been going off on a topic for like 45 minutes, Joe Rogan pops in and says, yeah, but what? He goes, wait, 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 wait. And he cuts them off. I'm not done yet. There's more, you know, but you're sitting there just, just sucking in all of this amazing information. He's fascinating to listen to, but his mind is not just a, he doesn't just answer it and close the book. He, his mind doesn't stop. He's got a busy active mind that just keeps on going and going and going. And that's what makes him who he is. I like being in that type of presence when I'm painting that kind of energy, that kind of thoughtfulness. I don't have to watch. I don't have to sit there and stare at the video. It's just two guys sitting in front of microphones talking. But I love to have that voice. I love to hear that while I paint. Another one is Vatividia, who does a lot of Souls videos and stuff like that. Calming, well-spoken, comforting. He's got a very warm, comforting voice. He's, he's fascinating. The way he picks apart the lore, the way he, the way he um, describes things. He's not just, he, the way he picks apart lore and the way he, he invests his heart and his feelings into everything he talks about pulls me into a very dark, calm, gentle place that I love. And it allows me to focus. And I just have all of his videos on autoplay. I'll just listen to them all day. Another one, let me know. 
L-E-M-M-I-N-O. He's a Swedish guy. Funny as all hell. <laughs> when he cracks little jokes, they're really funny. But he does these little mini documentaries on things like the Bermuda Triangle or or top 10 facts or or alien facts or things about many different fascinating topics. So he even did one on Dark Souls or ones on, on Witcher, anything. But he, again, he's got a calming, comforting voice, fascinating information, a little bit of humor every now and then that makes you laugh. And this, the tempo, the re I, can, I can go to bed listening to Let Me Know. I can go to bed watching Veda video because it just calms me. It relaxes me and it puts me into a meditative state. And I keep that autoplay button on, activated on YouTube, just so it just cycles through his videos. Um, and hell, if you've got any suggestions, let me know. Let me know which ones you like. I'm trying very desperately to say let me know and not let me know because, you know, that's where my head is right now. But let me know which, who you like to listen to. David Attenborough documentaries. I listen to him religiously. Religiously. He's got a calming, comforting voice. You're learning things. But it's just in the background. You can rewatch it six times. You won't get sick of watching it because it's, it's just, he's just, he's just a pleasure to listen to. And you learn something new every single time you watch his videos. But let me know in the comments below if you can think of any similar type YouTubers or podcasts or anything like that that you like to listen to and you paint because I, I'm always looking for ways to expand my repertoire of distracting, fascinating stuff to listen to. Now, why do I listen to those and not shorter videos? For one simple fact. One of the major, and it's, there are even, there's many documentaries and, and, and specialists talking about this right now. The reason why social media can absolutely obliterate focus is because of the tempo of it. You're watching short, entertaining videos. You're watching stuff that's quick, fast food type of entertainment, and you're cycling through it. But if you're watching five, 10 minute videos, if you're watching three minute videos, anything, I would say anything less than 30 minutes, which is kind of the majority of the stuff out there, then every single time that video ends and something else comes on, you have to pull yourself away from your screen and look for new content. That's what screws up your productivity because you're constantly getting pulled away from your screen. That's one of the reasons I love my Apple Watch. I absolutely love my Apple Watch. You know what the biggest benefit of Apple Watches is? Yes, it's convenient. It's got all those uh, those cool little features. And again, I in the last few videos, I might sound like I'm being an, uh, an Apple fanboy. I'm not an Apple fanboy. I'm not. But um, I mean, I like their products, but I'm not like goo goo gaga over it. But one of the main reason why I love my Apple, my Apple Watch is because it keeps me off my phone. I get a notification on my phone, like the one you heard before, and I look down at my watch and that's it. It's done. And then I put my wrist down. But otherwise, what I would be doing is I get that notification on my phone, I pick up my phone, I swipe into my phone, and then I look for the source of that thing. And before you know it, I've gotten sucked into searching on whatever social media or emails or whatever. I get sucked into them. But as a notification, I just look at it and I go, oh, okay, I got an email from so-and-so or, oh, you know, CBC News, just blah, 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 blah. And I get these little updates and it, it doesn't break my flow. So that's number two. Make sure you're looking for long, calming, thoughtful, non-visual stuff. I love watching PewDiePie at lunch when I'm taking a break because when I listen to PewDiePie, he makes me laugh. I'm watching the videos and the memes and I'm, 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 I'm having fun with his edits and stuff like that. Now, there's one other factor, one more thing. And this is something that came up with a student today and he was ironically the fourth student that I've spoken to this week who sent me an email telling me that he was experiencing this and he was going off talking about focus and how he was really he was really having a hard time finding motivation and stuff like that and then just happened to mention in it maybe it's hyperthyroidism maybe it's something else and I went a little light bulb went off I went hyperthyroid uh, um excuse me <laughs> And I mean, I haven't heard him back. We just emailed, we've been emailing back and forth today, but I went, well, I hate to break it to you, but your hypothyroid, your, your thyroid controls every single cell in your body. Your thyroid is the next chain in command after your pituitary gland. It's sending, it's sending thyroid hormone into your bloodstream. And if it's under or overactive, that will affect you 
profoundly. It can, depending on the severity of your, of your condition. If, for instance, if you find that despite how much you try to exercise and how much you try to eat well and how much you try to set your schedule, number one, you're just gaining weight uncontrollably or you're having an incredibly hard time losing a pound, even though you're, you're intermittent fasting or you're on, you're on a ketogenic diet and you're completely eliminated uh, sugar and salt out of your diet, and although completely eliminating salt's not a smart idea, a little bit of salt's good, specifically for your thyroid, but you're doing everything right over a long period of time and you are not losing a pound. If you find that you start to lose the outer thirds of your eyebrows, if you find you start losing hair on your body, if you start to feel lethargic, if you get brain fog, if you just feel exhausted all the time, you start getting muscle pains, joint pains all over the place, you sit down, you start to get depressed, and then you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have depression. You just want to smack them with the back of your head, you know? Oh, it's just depression. Here's some antidepressants. It might not have, have anything to do with that. Do you have any idea how many people are diagnosed with depression that have hypothyroidism? Get a blood test. It takes two freaking seconds. Go get a blood test and see what your thi what see the, the, the results of your thyroid. If it's hypo, if it's low, then all of those symptoms I just listed out for you would probably be... be it could be a combination of them. It could be all of them. It could be one of them. It can also slow down your digestive system. You might find yourself really getting bloated and constipated a lot. All of these things can happen to you. Get a blood test. It is one of the easiest things to check out. It takes two seconds. And right there, you'll know right away what's happening with your body. It could be something wrong with your thyroid. It could be something wrong with one, uh, with one chain in command. It could be your kidneys. It could be your liver. Maybe your, maybe your liver is not converting properly. Maybe there's something with your liver. Who knows? But finding out and taking medicine for it and regulating your thyroid can completely, you can realize that you've been suffering all these years and blaming yourself all these years because you're too lazy, you're too fat, you're too demotivated, you're too distracted, you're a child, you play video games too much. It might have nothing to do with that. You might just not be producing enough thyroid hormone. Check, just get a blood test and do a full blood and find out if there's something in your body that's not working properly. Because if you're doing everything else right, if you're doing everything else right, if you schedule yourself, if you regulate yourself, if you're sleeping great, you're getting regular sleep, you've got a good diet, you don't do anything in too much excess, you, you really sit down, you, you do this for weeks and weeks and weeks and you're seeing no results and you feel like as soon as you slip up once, you're thrown back two weeks and you just feel overwhelmed, there's a very good chance it's medical. It's not you, it could be medical, okay? So with that said, let's go through it as a quick check checklist for you. Number one, set a schedule. Program your hormones, program your, your system, program your body to send that wave when you jump on that surfboard so that you're not paddling on, on dead water, number one. Number two, find distractions that aren't too short and aren't too distracting. Get nice, meditative, thoughtful stuff that keeps you entertained, and but something you don't have to look at every five seconds, something that isn't demanding your eyes and something that doesn't require you to go and change the video every five minutes because that's gonna screw up your productivity. And if both of those don't fail, Go get a blood test and find out if your body is having fun with you. All right. So with that said, I'll leave you with that. Again, leave some suggestions in the description below, um, in the comments below on on different places you like, different things you like to listen to when you paint, because I'm always looking for stuff like that. I would hugely appreciate that. And as always, of course, I love you with all of my heart and happy painting. Take care.